An opinion poll is a sociological exercise that attempts to extract representative opinions from a sample of the relevant population. What that means in practice is that you ask a group of people questions in order to understand what they believe about something, and that group is meant to be proportionate to the larger group you're trying to assess. So if you wanted to understand what a particular demographic, let's say American teenagers, think about a new product, you would get a group of American teenagers with the right ratio of different backgrounds, cultures, tastes, ages, and ask them a series of questions in an attempt to uncover useful data, ranging from whether or not they like a particular thing to whether they'll buy it, at what price, why they do or do not like it, and so on. Scaled up to the size of a country, opinion polls are often used in the political world to predict voter turnout and who those voters will vote for. As with product market analysis, political pollsters identify a representative sampling, a group of people who are ratiotically representative of the racial and economic and educational and gender identity background of a voting population, and ask them questions about their intended future actions. Will they be voting in the upcoming election? Who for? Will they be going straight ticket or voting for people of various parties? What policies do they support? What news items make them wary about their choice? What do they think about the leading candidate from the other side? The theory is that if you can understand what this smaller but ostensibly depictive group thinks about something, you can then scale those findings up and have a pretty good idea within a semi-reliable confidence range, let's say with 5% uncertainty, who will win an election and who will lose, and often by how much, which groups will have changed their favored party since the last election, which demographics came out most strongly overall, and which came out most strongly for a given candidate, alongside other such data points. The first modern recorded opinion poll of this kind was conducted by a United States-based newspaper, the Harrisburg Pennsylvanian, in 1824, in an attempt to figure out who was favored in the upcoming presidential election between Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams. This poll, which was a subspecies of opinion poll called a straw poll, which most typically just involves having a group of people gather in one place and raise their hands to indicate if they agree with a statement or support a given candidate, as the group is asked questions, it proved to be accurate, or at the very least, it lined up with the eventual result, with Jackson winning both local and national elections. This success stimulated demand for similar polls for future elections, though they remained mostly local in nature until 1916, when a magazine called The Literary Digest conducted a national survey that accurately predicted Woodrow Wilson's election as U.S. president. That same magazine, using the same method, basically just mailing out postcards to readers and then counting the votes that were mailed back in the shape of filled out postcards, went on to accurately predict the next four presidential elections as well. The fifth subsequent election, though, between Alf Landon and Franklin D. Roosevelt, demonstrated a weakness in this method of poll-taking. Though they didn't realize it, the Literary Digest had a conservative-leaning bias in its readership, and thus in its poll results. The people who received the magazine, and as a result, the people who might share who they were supporting via those postcards, skewed heavily toward the Republican candidate, Landon, so their predictions favored him. Roosevelt won the election, and their poll failed to correctly predict the winner for the first time since its introduction. Another poll, though, conducted by a man named George Gallup for his company, the Gallup Organization, accurately predicted not just Roosevelt's victory, but that it would be a landslide, which it was. Gallup's polls, in contrast to those conducted by the Literary Digest, was demographically representative, the concept I mentioned earlier, where you carefully choose who you ask these questions to ensure you have the right number of people based on the proportionality of their demographic cohorts in the larger population, and then you scale up from there. Polling of this or any kind, though, is inherently riddled with issues. Some of the issues are practical in nature, like the fact that fewer and fewer people 
have landline telephones, which for a very long time were the prime and optimal means of contacting people to ask polling questions, but also a means of establishing who someone is, the person you're talking to, where do they live, how old are they, and other vital demographic factors, which helps to keep the polling numbers balanced. Other polling-related issues are psychological in nature, like the preponderance of so-called shy voters who don't want to divulge to anyone who they will be voting for because they're either private people who don't think it's any of your business, or they're embarrassed about who they plan to support. There's also what's often called the Bradley Effect, named after an African-American mayoral candidate from the early 1980s who seemed to be leading based on polls, but went on to lose his election. The theory behind all of that supposed but ultimately illusory support being that many of the white people who were surveyed didn't want to admit that they would be voting for the opposition candidate over the African-American candidate, not in public, anyway. There's also a larger meta-issue found in dividing people up based on broad, wildly imperfect labels. Putting people into demographic categories that might maybe kinda sorta represent their ideas, their tendencies, ideologies, and so forth, while also assuming these people will be suitable stand-ins for people who are supposedly like them based on that one standard, is an often flawed assumption, especially when the numbers you're working with are very small. Assuming there is just one African-American voter block, for instance, or one college-educated white female voter type is quite the leap of logic. It's a dramatic oversimplification. Yes, you can look at information of this kind and sometimes, at scale, perceive broad stroke patterns and trends, but the smaller the representative sample you're working with, the higher the chance that the handful of people from that group, the group that you're putting them in, by the way, not one that they necessarily would use to categorize themselves, the higher the chance that someone, or multiple someones from that sample, will be non-representative of the average of that group, and thus you will get very skewed data. And the same is true of people who earn a certain amount of money, people who work in a particular industry, people of a certain gender, and anything else that you might decide to use as a grouping mechanism. These groupings can sometimes show us large-scale patterns, but there are so many things that can go wrong in the collection, the extrapolation, the interpretation of this information, that much of the polling information we end up with, from many even quite serious-seeming sources that have high standards for other sorts of information that they collect and communicate to the public, they have fairly abysmal predictive records. This is not to say that we cannot glean insight from this type of extrapolation. It's just to say that if we try to get more specific than very broad-brush assumptions, we probably shouldn't be surprised if our polls fail to help us predict the future with any consistency or resolution. Common polling practices allow pollsters, at times, to claim to have a mere 3% margin of error when predicting the intended behavior of 260 million people based on the polling of only 1,004 human beings. And history has shown that these margins of error themselves can also be quite wrong. They can be based on faulty premises, or they can be based on the polling of larger numbers of people that have been more credibly vetted for certain behaviors or category affiliations, something that is increasingly difficult and expensive to accomplish, and thus, these degrees of certainty may not apply to the way that these polls are actually conducted in fact, as opposed to in theory. What I'd like to talk about today is democracy and some of the variables that can influence the exercise of and continued existence of such systems of government. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. If you are finding some value in this podcast, consider helping to contribute to its perpetuation. You can become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things, and your contribution of any amount each month will gain you access to an additional episode of the show each month. Now, hopefully that bonus is enjoyable for those who get it. It's certainly enjoyable for me to produce, but most importantly, this type of direct contribution is what allows me to continue to produce this show. So whether you're able to contribute a couple of bucks or substantially more than that, your support makes a huge amount of difference in the amount of time that I'm able to commit to this project each week. A great big thanks to everybody who's already contributed in some way, shape, or form. 
and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. Part of the reason election polling is so fraught with inconsistency and, increasingly, public mistrust is that you seldom see such polls without accompanying interpretation by people who are often just filtering this already flawed data through the lens of their own biases. Another problem here, though, is that polling, from the most foundational level, is prone to unseen bias. And as was the case with the Literary Digest's slant toward more conservative readers, it's often impossible to know what bias you're inserting into the data until after the fact. When the future arrives and you realize your prognostications were off, potentially way off. Two recent and fairly well-known cases of vast amounts of polling being seemingly quite wrong can be found in the election of Donald Trump to the presidency of the United States in 2016 and the UK vote to leave the European Union that same year. In the case of that US election, a post hoc assessment of the national polls showed that the numbers were actually fairly accurate in terms of the eventual outcome. The degree of uncertainty in national polls accounted almost perfectly for the end result of that election in most cases. State polls were a very different issue, though, and it was later found that many of these polls that slanted heavily toward Hillary Clinton, the Democratic competitor who won the popular vote but lost the electoral vote, were way off because these local polls failed to account for non-college-educated voters, a demographic that heavily supported Donald Trump. Similarly, the 2016 Brexit referendum polls showed that Leave and Remain were roughly equivalent in numbers, but additional weight was given by some pollsters to surveys conducted via phone, which is not uncommon, as phone interviews are considered to be more accurate in terms of the demographic that you're actually reaching, but also more accurate because people are believed to be more honest when they're speaking compared to when they are filling out a random form on the internet, with the increased presumed anonymity that such form filling allows. As it turns out, though, phone-conducted surveys slanted the information gathered in this case heavily toward Remain, as a higher level of graduates were reached via that medium than was the case with other mediums and the assumptions of phone survey superiority by a handful of major polls then influenced the larger, more popular polls of polls, which averaged the findings of the smaller polls into larger, ostensibly more reliable megapolls. In short, then, a few seemingly small biases, like the favoring of info gleaned from phones over other collection mechanisms, and the mental watering down of information from certain demographic cohorts, added up in such a close vote. 52% voted leave in the end, compared to 48% for remain. And that tiny difference had a massive impact on expectations and predictions. It's possible, too, in both US and UK examples, that the commentators and experts tasked with interpreting this polling data were defaulting to what they considered to be the status quo. A lifelong politician and denizen of the White House over a reality TV star, and the UK's existing long-time EU status versus the new and unknown leaving of the EU, when presented with data that was close on both accounts. This flavor of regression fallacy is predicated on the assumption that things that have been the case, which are perceived to be normal, are more likely to remain true than things that could become the new normal, but for which we have more difficulty imagining, because it hasn't happened before. There's some logic to this default position, but when it comes to interpreting data and making predictions based on that information, it's easy to see how something as close as the Leave Remain Brexit vote, with just a few percentage points separating the poll numbers and an understood deviation of anywhere from 3 to 5%, could be nudged into seeming like something truly predictive by those who suspect the status quo will hold, even when that's not with the numbers actually necessarily say. On top of the data world issues that arise when we use fluffy numbers in this way, there are real-world consequences that can arise as a result of these interpretations. If you read or listen to the news, for instance, and are told that polling numbers show your preferred candidate or party has little chance of closing the numerical gap 
between themselves and their competitor, that could influence your vote, couldn't it? I mean, you don't want to throw your vote away on someone who has no chance of winning. So maybe you cast a protest vote or a tactical vote or you don't vote at all. What's the point? Looking at those numbers, why even make the drive across town in the rain for something so pointless? These predictions, these numbers and the conversations and extrapolations that we drive from them can become self-fulfilling prophecy in this way. And that's alarming because, again, the numbers themselves are imperfect. The way we use them are imperfect. And the ways in which we respond to those predictions and interpretations are imperfect. And yet, because of the nature of the businesses that collect these numbers, and of the entities like newspapers and shows and websites that report upon these numbers, and which at times report on them as if they're scores in a football game, or as if they are accurately informing us as to who's leading in a horse race, there's a lot of incentive to continue collecting these numbers and reporting upon them and misunderstanding them because it's good for business and ostensibly good for political involvement, even if that involvement is predicated on misunderstanding and at times unintentionally spreading misinformation, all of which can deleteriously influence the very process, that of democracy, that this data is meant to measure and analyze and inform upon, and at its best, even bolster. The article I'd like to unspool today comes from Quartz, and it's entitled, The U.S. Government Holds Balloons to Stricter Standards Than It Does Voting Machines. This piece covers the concerns raised by a recent report published by the Brennan Center for Justice, entitled, A Framework for Election Vendor Oversight, Safeguarding America's Election System in which the BCJ concludes that elections in the United States have suffered and will continue to suffer from faulty, perhaps devastatingly faulty, vote tallying and other election hardware and software, which creates a fundamental vulnerability for these elections, and up a level, potentially, for American democracy. From that quartz piece, quote, Right now, oversight of election systems is primarily the purview of state and local authorities, Manufacturers of voting machines are not mandated to report system irregularities or foreign ownership or control, nor are they obligated to patch faulty software or secure sensitive physical infrastructure, the report says. Further, vendors of voting systems are not required to perform background checks on employees, which the Brennan Center flags as a serious issue. System testing only occurs at the end of the manufacturing process and doesn't ensure that vendors adhere to proper supply chain or cybersecurity controls during the development, programming, or deployment phases. Although the Senate recently approved a $250 million spending bill to protect the 2020 elections from outside interference, experts say this amount, quote, doesn't come close, end quote, to what's needed. Proper funding could support, among other things, a robust federal regime with formal standards for all vendors, meaning U.S. election infrastructure would have to conform to the same sorts of standards as baby rattles, charcoal briquettes, antiquing kits, pajamas, ballpoint pens, bunk beds, carpets, stuffed animals, garage door openers, plant food, toy trains, and, of course, balloons, end quote. The voting machine and voting system industry in the United States is controlled by an oligopoly, which is kind of like a monopoly, but in this case with three companies owning and defending a market against outside competition rather than just one. Those three main companies being Dominion Voting Systems Corporation, Hart InterCivic Incorporated, and Election Systems and Software, often called ES and S. All three of these companies have carved out territories throughout the United States, and Dominion and es and &S also have flourishing wings in Canada, and all three have been subjected to scrutiny from legal and journalistic investigations over the past few decades due to flaws and irregularities found in their systems. Hart, for instance, was part of an investigation in Ohio in 2007 that showed its products and the other four systems used for elections that year had critical flaws that could, quote, undermine the integrity of the 2008 general election, end quote. During the 2018 Texas general election, it was found that voters using Hart's e-slate voting machine, a machine that was used in 82 Texas counties that year, and which had been certified for use in the state for nearly a decade, could have their votes changed or flipped if the machine was used just right 
by someone who knew what they were doing. But such changes in vote flipping could also happen accidentally if someone hit the right button at the wrong time. During elections in Georgia that same year, touch screen balloting units from Dominion randomly rebooted while voters were interacting with them, and some of the physical computerized cards given to voters, which they would then feed into the machines, in turn telling the machines which ballots to display for them, either failed to bring up anything, or brought up the wrong ballots. ESNS, though, which is the largest of the big three voting technology companies in North America, holding about 50% of the U.S.'s election system market, has had the most controversial couple of decades, due in large part to their ubiquity throughout the continent, especially in areas where local governments are attempting to roll out what they hope will be superior, updated, futuristic voting technologies, and in part because of how they, as a company, typically handle issues that arise. In 2006, ESNS voting machines in Sarasota, Florida, lost about 18,000 votes. And after an internal assessment and flurry of testing, the company said that they didn't know what happened, but whatever it was, it definitely was not their fault. In Georgia, during that same election where Dominion machines were randomly rebooting, ESNS machines seemed to have left portions of the cast ballots blank. Of nearly 4 million cast ballots, 160,000 of them, about 4.3%, left the lieutenant government portion of the ballot blank. A highly irregular number, especially in an election so widely publicized and hotly contested. That particular potential error has set off alarm bells in some portions of the electoral oversight and investigative journalism world, as the number of potentially missing votes is higher than the difference between the winner and the loser for lieutenant governor in that race. The winner won by 123,172 votes, and the maybe missing votes numbered 160,000. So there's a chance that those missing votes, if they were left off ballots due to a flaw in the system, could have installed the wrong person in higher political office. Now, importantly, this by itself does not mean anything definitive. In fact, it's expected that in a normal election, somewhere between 1 and 2% of people will leave portions of their ballot blank because they don't particularly care about who becomes the lieutenant governor or because they only showed up to vote for one particular candidate or issue. 4.3% is substantially higher than 1 or 2%, but all the same. It could very well be human error in this case, not system or hardware error. That ESNS has the reputation it has, though, is part of why this issue is considered to be such a trust issue by so many people in the know. Malfunctions have been reported in ESNS voting machines dozens of times in cities all around the United States. Alongside those malfunctions, there have also been reports of inconsistent voting numbers, user error amplifying interfaces, things that cause people to make more mistakes, thus technically being human errors, but actually being human errors caused by bad or faulty design, and pre-election test failures, including a 2010 issue in Ohio in which 10% of a county's ESNS supplied voting machines had failed pre-election tests, followed by nearly two years of investigation that concluded that the make and model of machine in question should be decertified for use. A few years later, though, those machines were recertified, mysteriously, for reasons that have not been fully or consistently explained by those who do the certifications. Most recently, in early 2018, the New York Times reported upon remote access software that had been discovered in election management software that was being used in Pennsylvania. This remote access software was reportedly pre-installed in some vote management systems so that ESNS could provide remote IT help to troubleshoot and provide maintenance services for their machines. But that specific excuse for the back door, which was provided by several anonymous quoted sources for the story, was denied by the company when they were asked formally. They claimed, when asked about a purported back door, that none of the employees at the company had any knowledge of their software or other systems ever being sold with remote access software pre-installed. U.S. Senator Ron Wyden wrote a letter to the company to request clarification on this matter soon after. And the company wrote him back in a letter that was later made public, saying that, okay, yeah, maybe, some of their systems did have remote access software installed. The reason this last revelation is potentially such an issue 
is that, although election management systems are not used to collect votes directly, they are used to manage the votes that come in. So you can picture them as kind of like a big, somewhat more complex Excel spreadsheet that collects and adds up all the votes as they are cast via the vote-taking machines and software. They are the central hub to which all of these other pieces of voting infrastructure are connected. This means that if you could gain access to these central systems to which all the voting data flows, you could conceivably adjust the final vote numbers. And because there are generally no paper ballots involved when you use digital voting technologies, that is one of their purported benefits, though it's also something that they are rethinking for future elections as a consequence of all these troubles they've had. But when you start using digital voting technologies, typically you cannot go back and do a recount. The numbers have been added up and summed and stored in that voting system. What's there is there, and there's not really a backup set of numbers you can check if you worry that maybe those numbers have been falsified. There are several aspects of this situation that I think are worth thinking about, considering in greater detail. First is that oligopolies, in general, tend to be non-ideal for many of the same reasons that monopolies tend not to be ideal. They reduce competition. They favor the oligopolists over consumers, which in this case, in the case of voters, is citizens. It's the voting population. And they create a situation in which those major players can salt the soil around them so that no other upstarts can be planted and can grow up to challenge their existing thrones. We see this in cartels like OPEC, in which groups of oil-producing companies and countries get together to set prices amongst themselves, so they aren't as likely to be the victims of fluctuations in the free market, and they can hold most of the power when it comes to their own financial destinies, even if that power comes at the expense of consumers. But we also arguably see it in the world of big tech, where a few major social networks and a few major ad sellers and a few major browsers and search engines and phone manufacturers are able to set up shop, capture as many advantages as possible, and then recalibrate their industries, including, at times, being involved in the writing of regulatory rules for their industries in ways that favor them and their interests. So that at some point, it's nearly impossible to imagine some upstart, some garage-built company, challenging Amazon's dominance when it comes to online infrastructure, or challenging Google's chokehold on web-based ad sales, or Facebook's dominance in the world of social media. They might compete with each other, and they very often do, but lacking the time, money, and regulatory advantages that these tech titans enjoy, it's unlikely that merely having a better idea is enough anymore, which flies in the face of a more pure version of capitalism, as it's generally imagined anyway. Just as certain technologies evolve in this kind of way to latently favor one group or company over another, some laws have evolved to do the same. And the laws we have on the books in the United States, including those meant to help secure our elections, are often used by companies like ES&S to sue local communities, local governments, if they don't choose to use ES&S products for their elections. According to some excellent reporting about this industry that's been conducted by ProPublica over the years, ES&S filed a federal lawsuit against Cook County, Illinois, when the county decided to go with another company for their voting equipment needs, a $30 million purchase that ES&S wanted for themselves. In that particular case, ES&S dropped the lawsuit after it sufficiently delayed the purchase so that Cook County would have to wait until their next election cycle to replace their existing machines something that might have been the consequence of ES&S simply changing their mind, but which some industry watchers believe was the company making a statement. You buy from someone else, we will mess up your elections and occupy your time and resources with abundant legal complications, and that will force you to continue using that outdated equipment that you are trying so hard to replace. These lawsuits and threats of lawsuits have proven to be a potent tool for this company both in terms of garnering business for themselves and in terms of delaying the implementation of new technologies that might outshine theirs. And that's according to more than two dozen voting technology experts and election officials that were interviewed for a recent ProPublica investigation. And I'll link to one of their articles in the show notes in particular, which is entitled, The Market for Voting Machines is Broken, This Company Has Thrived in It, which is about ESNS specifically and how they abuse the legal system to hold on to their leading position in this industry.
According to ES&S officials who provided a statement for that story, the company is so litigious because it believes American voters deserve accountability, and it's the only way to keep their competitors honest, to keep their competitors from scamming these electoral bodies that don't know any better. They position their lawsuits as protective for voters, in other words, because they believe if they don't, bad equipment will be installed, and we won't be able to trust the foundations of our democratic systems much longer. That is a very interesting position for a company with such a history of mistakes and controversies to take, but I suspect it's exactly what their competitors would say as well. And I think it's possible for them to both believe that they are genuinely protecting democracy and that they are genuinely protecting their bottom line at the same time, even if one of those two things guides their actions a little more tactically than the other quite often. One other issue we're thinking about here ties back to the larger concept of trust, not just within the systems we use for voting, but the meta-system of democracy itself. There have been issues with voting and the mechanisms we use for voting since the beginning of voting. Whether we're using marbles or paper ballots or touchscreen technologies, there are things that can go wrong. There are things that have gone wrong, and there are things that will continue to go wrong in the future. That's the nature of the beast, unfortunately. And it's something that we can figure out broad scope regulations for. But these things are also likely to continue to go wrong in new and innovative ways, which means we need to have flexibility and a roll with the punches attitude about this, alongside plans that say what we do and how we do it should something go sideways in obvious and non-obvious ways. And that last point is particularly true in an electorate that's becoming increasingly polarized to the point where any close, and even some not in any way close results, will be contested as errors or fraud by the losing side. We're going to need more resilient and flexible systems for dealing with this, as at the moment, our elections are fragmented and fragile, and riddled with complexities that make them vulnerable to human error or to a suitably creative and or clever opponent. When it comes to opponents in this space, it's still up in the air as to whether any of these issues with ballots cast, with tabulation, with the removal of paper receipts throughout the process, and the muddling of the user interfaces, have anything to do with the fact that some of these companies have foreign owners and investors, that some of their products have been shown to have backdoors installed which could be used by foreign or domestic interests to manipulate voter counts, and the issues surrounding tribal self-interest that have made even the most mundane-seeming elections the targets of speculation about some politician or bureaucrat with access using their positions to rig the process of voting, rig the way electoral votes are divvied out, or rig the numbers after they've come in. I personally think it's far more likely that most of these errors, if not all of them, are truly just errors. But I also acknowledge that the nastier and more tribal politics becomes the more incentive there is, on a personal and a professional level, for people and groups to do something illegal or just morally wrong in order to get that victory that they crave or that they feel their party needs. It's not impossible, then, that Russians are hacking U.S. elections in a more direct non-social media and data-leaking way, or that the same sort of hacks and direct abuses are being conducted by members of one party or another, officially, or by rogue supporters in the position to mess with aspects of the voting infrastructure. But I would also argue that everything we've seen thus far can be rationally explained by incompetence and lack of care. And as Hanlon's razor states, Never attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by stupidity. Or in this case, that which can be adequately explained by stupidity, ignorance, bad design, and lax regulations, meant to bolster the existence and sturdiness of entrenched and politically spendy oligopolists. One more way of looking at this situation is that the same sort of damage to a country's electoral system could be achieved just as thoroughly, if not more so, and probably far less expensively and more easily by destroying the legitimacy of the electoral process in the eyes of the electorate, rather than aiming for a one-off victory that could backfire into support for a system that is now perceived to be under attack by a shared external enemy. What that means in practice is that if you are, for instance, Russia, and you're able to access American voting systems, voting machines, or voting records, it might be a better use of your hacking-related powers to just mess with things to make the whole system look flawed and broken, 
rather than opting for a more typical cinematic trope and changing the ballot numbers to elect someone you think will favor you and your cause. The best way to kill a democratic system, in other words, might be less Manchurian candidate and more ESNS. If you hacked your way to getting your favorite politician elected, you'd probably want people to continue believing in their system because then they wouldn't question the legitimacy of your politician on a leash. Bringing down that system, though, requires that people don't take it seriously, which in turn leads to less voter turnout, leads to more corruption and incompetence at the highest ranks of government, leads to weaker overall infrastructure, a weakened economy, a badly funded and maintained military, bad alliances, worse health and economic outcomes for citizens, and increased polarization amidst the populace and between the people they send into political office, creating a practical stasis and sense of mismanagement and constant conflict within their ranks. In short, you could probably cause a lot more and a lot longer term damage by getting people to ask what's so good about democracy anyway, and by making it seem as if such a system just leads to more corruption, more insiders enriching themselves, more strange and unexplained issues with the voting system. At a certain point, people might begin to ask themselves why they should even care about the central tenets of their country, their government, why they should believe in it, fight for it, if those tenets are predicated on such weak and unmaintainable and seemingly corrupt concepts. Looping back to the intro real quick, recall that even election polls, flawed and seemingly innocuous as they are, can influence our elections. Simply believing that one politician is ahead of another can influence our vote one way or another, and can even influence if we vote in the first place. And the sort of horse race politics that we've gotten so accustomed to, presented by myriad very well-meaning entities that are probably telling themselves that this helps people become more politically involved, that can lead to increased tribalism and polarization between the people cheering for their different teams and allowing themselves to become emotionally involved with the day-to-day -day changes in seeming relative position between these different groups. There are an immense number of variables tweaking the way we see the world, the way we think about things, and the way we eventually behave, the things we do. We are all targets, all day, every day, targeted by thousands upon thousands of messages attempting to convince us to live a certain way, buy certain things, spend our time or money or energy on this or that or this other thing, and to change our habits, our beliefs, our ideologies, and the practical manifestations of all of those things. Our perception of our systems of governance, whether they're democracy-based or predicated on some other set of structural values, are kind of the same thing for our societies as our beliefs are for us as individuals. And they're influenced in terms of stability and shape and in terms of their continued existence by our belief in them, maintenance of them, and periodic revisitation and revitalization of them. It's almost certainly not possible to completely 100% protect any of these systems, especially those predicated on giving a voice to the majority of people rather than a tightly controlled insider group. But being more aware of these variables, the outside and internal lenses that can distort the way we see the world, can help us individually control for some of the more obvious and common ones. <music> If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. By supporting the show at any level, any amount each month, you gain access to an additional episode of the show, and you are helping to ensure I'm able to continue committing the time that I do to this project each and every week. Also super helpful is leaving a quick review of the show wherever you listened to it, and or sharing the show with a friend or with your social network of choice. A huge thanks to everyone who's already contributing in some way, shape, or form to the show. That means the world to me. Thank you very much. The book that I'd like to recommend today is entitled Bottle of Lies, The Inside Story of the Generic Drug Boom by Catherine Eben, E-B-A-N. This book was a bit of a surprise to me because I, like many people I think, had always kind of considered generic drugs to be this unmitigated good Thing. Patents run out on big-name drugs, generics move in, and they are able to provide essentially the same thing for a far lower price. And while that is sometimes the case, 
It's also the case that the world of generic drugs has its own problems in terms of quality, in terms of sleazy business tactics, and in terms of how the system post-patent works. This book is a wonderful piece of narrative non-fiction, and it does an excellent job of deep diving into how this world works, the world of generic drugs, and how it fits in with other aspects of the pharmaceuticals and medical world that you might have heard a bit more about. If any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Bottle of Lies by Catherine Eben. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. If you're enjoying what I'm doing here, you'll probably also enjoy one of the publications that I produce. It's called Brain Lenses, and it actually connects pretty well to something we discussed on this episode today. It's all about the variables that influence and shape and distort very often the way that we see the world, both internal and external. If you'd like to receive that in your inbox each week for free, pop on over to brainlenses.com and subscribe. Feel free to reach out and say hello on your social network of choice. I am at Colin is my name on most of those, just Colin Wright on Facebook. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.